the kind introduction and uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to be at least virtually again in Sri Lanka. So I will share my screen. And I hope you can see already my, my slides. Um, I also put into the chat the link uh, our all participants can use uh, to be able to precipitate in the interactive poll questions. Um, yeah, and uh, with this, I think we, we can start um, yeah, with the presentation. And the topic of today is the patient blood management. I modified a little bit in liver disease and transplantation. And uh, what we want to do is an interactive case-based uh, discussion. You heard already about my background. And of course, uh, the most important conflict of interest is that since 10 years, I'm the global medical director of uh, Tem Innovations, a Rotem company. Uh, another conflict of interest maybe for me is that, uh, uh, yeah, more than three years ago, uh, I was just doing a presentation in Singapore. There was a terroristic attack uh, in Colombo, which I have still very well in, in mind, uh, which is, of course, or was uh, a very uh, severe event. And yeah, now since weeks, we have uh, another political issue, uh, which is a conflict between Russia uh, and the Ukraine. Just coming back to the idea using poll questions. So I integrated, uh, I think if you have the number right in mind, eight cases into my presentation. And with this link, which you can also find in the chat and just copy paste, um, that's the way how you can get the poll questions on your phone. And also when we have the first uh, questions uh, in the interactive cases, you should have the possibility to um, enter your um, uh, answers to the poll questions. I just start with the, the first question, not poll question, but what we have. Uh, if uh, we have to deal with patients with uh, chronic liver disease. And one important question is, will my patient bleed? Uh, and uh, this is just a quote from Niels Bohr, who said uh, years ago that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And this is, of course, also true if we discuss uh, bleeding issues. Uh, and uh, the, the reason why this is quite difficult is that the so-called positive predictive value of standard coagulation tests and viscoelastic testing for bleeding is only 15 to 25%. That means you can have pathologic results, but the patient doesn't have to bleed. When we look at the situation using standard coagulation tests in patients with cirrhosis undergoing invasive cardiovascular procedures, we know in between that using standard coagulation tests like PT, INR, or also thrombocytopenia overestimates the bleeding risk in this patient population. There's also a quite interesting uh, meta-analysis or systematic review uh, published one year ago, where they also were looking at viscoelastic testing like TEC or ROTEM to identify patients uh, undergoing liver surgery, whether they have normal, hyper or hypocoagulable status. And uh, using viscoelastic testing, 77% showed normal coagulation, so they are rebalanced. Um, 18 to 19% a hypercoagulability, and only 4 to 5% a hypocoagulability. When we use conventional coagulation tests, the picture is different because then um, more than one third, uh, so here in this study, 34% have a normal coagulation status, uh, 65 to 66% a hypocoagulability, and none of the patients are hypercoagulability. 
When we look at the real outcome, none of the patients, so zero from 291 experienced postoperative hemorrhage, but about 6% experienced postoperative thromboembolic events, not reflected by the standard coagulation test, but quite in line with, with scholastic testing. And also when we look at this um, systematic review and meta-analysis um, regarding bleeding, intraoperative bleeding and transfusion in patients, again, um, which have uh, um, a chronic liver disease and have to undergo surgery, we see that with scholastic testing significantly reduced the intraoperative blood loss. And also, uh, the amount of fresh frozen plasma and platelet transfusion was significantly reduced, uh, whether it's about pre-procedural interventions, acute bleeding, or transplantation. Um, and this is also in line with the hypercoagulability profile, uh, which has also been detected here in this study from the group from Paolo Simeone from Padua in Italy, uh, where they also showed that in particular in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma and a hypercoagulability um, characterized by an increased clot firmness in FIPTAM, that these patients have a five-fold increased risk of portal vein thrombosis. So again, also hypercoagulability can be quite good detected uh, by viscolastic testing in patients with chronic liver disease. Now we move from prediction to why does my patient bleed? And here we don't use any more the positive predictive value, we use a negative predictive value of viscolastic testing for bleeding, and this is 90 to 97%. So that means we use here viscolastic testing to stepwise eliminate bleeding or issues or reasons for bleeding. Uh, and uh, these negative, highly negative predictive values are used in algorithms uh, to decide what's the best way to stop bleeding if the patient is bleeding. And uh, here we have to consider that one of the most important reasons for bleeding in patients with chronic liver disease is not coagulopathy, it's more the increased portal pressure. Um, and this is something which is very important because if we have a bleeding patient with a chronic liver disease, giving huge volumes, whether this is uh, a fresh frozen plasma or red blood cells or just crystalloids or colloids, that this can increase the bleeding risk in this patient population. So we should be very careful with huge volumes because they just support the bleeding. And this has been already recognized uh, more than 10 years ago in this uh, uh, paper uh, published by Tom Lisman and this group that the pre-procedure correction of coagulation tests with blood products might not be necessary and may have even harmful effects because when they result in fluid overload, they can also result in an exacerbation of portal hypertension and therefore can promote bleeding rather than to stop the bleed. And this is also uh, mentioned in this study from our group in Essen, uh, published here by, by Fuad Zahner, that's the uh, chair of the liver transplant ICU, um, that again, uh, without clear signs of excessive bleeding, we should be very restrictive with blood products because they quite often, in particular, if huge amounts of plasma are used, can result in fluid overload and portal hypertension. What uh, uh, Bagia and me also published recently in the Sri Lankan Journal of Hematology is uh, the so-called car-based model of hemostasis, which might be a little bit more appropriate to characterize what's really going on in hemostasis in patients with chronic liver disease. What they have is a problem of the starter of the coagulation system, which is the extrinsic pathway. And that means 
that um, if there is a tissue factor and factor seven, it's, it's not here the drug, it's uh, the, the factor seven, uh, which is in the circulation, and this uh, gets activated on the subendothelial cells. There are some activated platelets and factor 10 and factor five uh then start to produce small amounts of thrombin but since the factors the vitamin k then factors produced in the liver are quite low the starter is not working very well however then with the additional activation and more and more amounts of thrombin um, there is finally uh, in particular due to the very high amounts of factor eight uh, then more and more thrombin generation. So if the engine of the car is once running, uh, there's quite a lot of thrombin generation. And finally, fibrinogen is converted to fibrin monomers and uh, also by then activation of factor 13 to factor 13A, uh, there is finally insoluble fibrin. So when the starter is quite weak, but the engine is running well, we have a third issue. And the third issue means that the, um, the inhibitors of the coagulation system are also not working very well. So antithrombin is quite often low. And also uh, a protein C uh, is low. So that means that in the cirrhotic patients, the accelerators factor five and factor eight are, are not inhibited enough. So that means if the engine is once running, the brakes of the system have a problem. And that finally can result in thromboembolic issues. So next question is how to fix this bleeding issue uh, in a patient with a chronic liver disease. So option one is just to use a massive transfusion protocol, but the issue is that giving a lot of volume may even support bleeding. And therefore, I think option two is the better option, which we call a massive hemorrhage protocol or a massive transfusion avoiding protocol. So that means the key is not to give a lot of transfusion, key is to stop the bleed and avoid a volume overload. And there are a lot of studies in the field of chronic liver disease, which not only show like in other settings that we can just use a restrictive protocol with the same outcome as a liberal, in patients with chronic liver disease, it's even the other way around, that the restrictive transfusion is clearly associated with lower all-cause mortality, here with a relative risk for red blood cell transfusion of 0.65. So a restrictive red blood cell transfusion reduces uh, all-cause mortality at least by one-third. And at the same time, there is a significant reduction in rebleeding. So that shows that we really should be as restrictive as possible. And this is not only true for the red blood cells, it's the same for plasma transfusion. And we see here in this multicenter trial uh, published in August 2021, that again, fresh frozen plasma transfusion was associated with an increased odds of mortality at 42 days with an odds ratio of 9.4. So nearly a tenfold increase in mortality. And at the same time, a failure to control bleeding at day five and a prolonged length of stay at the ICU. And we see a very similar effect also for platelet transfusion here in particular during liver transplantation at reperfusion, where we also see that if we have to give platelet transfusion, there is a, a, a significant decrease in 90 day survival from 94% to 79%. So again, you should also be restrictive with platelet transfusion. So what we, can we learn from this, even in patients just with chronic liver disease undergoing invasive procedures, so not already liver transplantations. But this is a study 
study again from Italy, uh, published already seven years ago, and showed that if we use clot firmus in thrombolastometry instead of plated count, uh, we see that plated transfusion can be reduced again at least by one third without increased risk of bleeding, but a less complication and less costs. And very similar results have been shown also, uh, because here also the question was, do we have to do a pre-procedural intervention if we have pathologic INR or plated count uh, before invasive procedures? But what we see is that uh, there is no significant reduction anymore uh, for plasma because it's not used at all in this patient anymore in our institution. But you see that the use of proton being complex concentrate significantly reduced. And it's also for platelets as only a slight increase in the use of fibrinogen. So that brings us to the next question, why we are performing viscoelastic testing. So it's a part of a routine guided bleeding management before procedures, but then we should be even more restrictive and only treat if there's bleeding or in patient blood management during procedures with bleeding. And then of course the aim is to reduce bleeding and blood loss in order to increase patient safety, which is not a new idea because that was already mentioned two and a half thousand years ago from Hippocrates that the primary aim is, of course, on the one hand to cure, but even more important, not to uh, um, provide additional harm. We started quite early with algorithms, but you can already see that this one, and that was the first one we published in 2006, is much too complex. Uh, so that means nobody really can work with this. Uh, and that was the reason why in the last 10 years, uh, we tried to simplify algorithms. And we also published these algorithms uh, in uh, several te clinical textbooks, as well as in the review paper I mentioned already in the Sri Lanka Journal of Hematology. So what we see here is that there is a step-by-step -step, uh, protocol like a flight checklist on the left side. There is always the clinical situation or the rotum results. And then on the right side is the potential uh, intervention. And very important is that this algorithm is for bleeding patients. So you see here, the first question is whether there is diffuse bleeding and we have to consider blood transfusion or other hemostatic intervention. If this is answered with no, more or less the algorithm ends. Um, if we have bleeding, we first consider if there is a need for tranexamic acid. Then we look at clot firms and we go more into details with the cases which we want to discuss. Clot firms in XTEM and FIPTEM, which give us information if we have an issue with fibrin polymerization or platelet aggregation. If this is not true, we are looking at the clotting time in XTEM. And if this is prolonged, we can think about increasing thrombin generation with four-factor protein complex concentrate or fresh frozen plasma. But again, we have to be very careful with the volume. There's also from time to time a so-called endogenous uh, heparin effect in patients with chronic liver disease. And this is also something which we can discriminate by using ROTAM and the clotting time ratio between interim and heptam, because this is prolonged if it's a heparin effect or it's normal if it's just a factor deficiency. And if after the intervention there is ongoing bleeding, we should take a new blood sample and recheck and run the protocol again. This algorithm is much simpler, but of course there are some footnotes uh, which gives or just some reminders when it's good to measure. We have of course also to consider the basics like temperature, pH, calcium level, uh, how to calculate a fibrinogen dose, 
Um, it's also here a reminder that if clot firmness is very low, like the XTEM A5 below 10 millimeters, then quite often we need a combined intervention by giving fibrinogen with fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate and platelets, because just one intervention will not be enough to increase the clot firmness uh, um, into the targeted area. And there is also a reminder that if we have severe bleeding in the first round, we can also do up to three intervention at the same time. And then when we do the fine tuning, we go down with a number of intervention. And we will discuss this in the cases. And there is also an opportunity to modify algorithms for the pediatric population. That's for livers, not a, a, a big change in the cutoff values, but of course the dosing has to be much more precise than in the adults. So that means we are already now go into the first cases. And I just start not here with a liver transplantation, but with a uh, GI bleeding. And what we have here is a, um, a video recording. Uh, it's like remote viewing, but it uh, shows the, the, um, the thermogram in 20 times speed. And at the right side, you will always have the algorithm um, available. So I hope that you could see the thermogram, how it's developing. And um, I just help a little bit in the, in the first case. So up to now, we don't see any decrease of clot firmness. So no significant hyperfibrolysis. But when we look here at clot firmness uh, in XTEM, um, that is still fine, it's 30 millimeters, uh, but the FIPTEM is quite low. So the question is again, what's the clinical situation? Do we have an ongoing upper GI bleeding? If yes, uh, we could see that the main issue is here, for example, a low fibrinogen. So just to explain how the uh, poll questions are working. Um, so what is the best intervention in this case? Uh, we will see in the next slide then the, the real poll questions for voting. Um, that is just that you see still also the thermogram at the same time. So is that a case where we should give plasma transfusion? Should we give plated transfusion? Should we replace fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate? Should we give proton bean complex concentrate or recommend factor 7a? And I hope, at least at my uh, phone, I see the questions, they occurred. And um, we see at least already one voting. I hope there, there will be more. Um, or everybody selected the same intervention. That's also possible. Now there's somebody also using a different option. So most um, would give fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate, and I agree with that uh, because the FIPTAM was uh, quite low. Um, there was no issue for thrombin generation. So from my point of view, there is no need to replace recommend factor 7a. It's the most expensive intervention. Um, but not needed here. Um, just to show you how we develop these cutoff values um, in studies, that's a study again from our liver transplant ICU. So that's even prediction of bleeding after liver transplantation at the ICU. And then we do a rock curve analysis and uh, see what is the optimal cutoff. And you see when we look at the PT in percent of normal, we don't need 50%. Something um, at around 30% is, is quite nice. But still, it has only a positive predictive value of 24%. So even if the, the percentage of normal so the quick value is below 30%. There is only uh, one quarter of the patients bleeding. 
uh, when we use the X stem clotting time, we see that the negative predictive value is even higher, nearly 97% compared to 91%. So again, even the clotting time in X stem has a better negative predictive value. And we can also use a clot firmness in X stem as in FIPTEM. And you see here again, if the FIPTEM, for example, is higher than 13, um, there is a very low chance that we improve anything by giving more fibrinogen. And uh, this has also been shown even uh, in uh, the studies from Luc Mazicot, uh, who is working in Canada and has a very low transfusion rate. But what he showed was, again, that the FIPTEM is one of the best predictors for bleeding uh, in liver transplantation. There's a second case also with upper GI bleeding. Uh, this is an older case, therefore I don't have a, a, a video recording. So we just have the final thermogram here. And uh, yeah, just have a look. And uh, then we can also go through the algorithm. And the question is here. Um, yeah, what is the main reason for bleeding or what might be an adequate intervention if it's a coagulopathic bleeding? That will be the poll question again. What's the most appropriate intervention? Should we also in this case give fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate? Uh, we can see here the FIPTEM, that's here the MCF. So that's about uh, two to three millimeters higher than the A5. Uh, so it would be about nine to 10 millimeters. Uh, should we give plasma transfusion? Should we give a PCC? Should we give a plated transfusion or recommend factor 7A? So it's a poll question again. Let's see what is the intervention you would do in this case. So we have actually 50%. No, it's two thirds fibrinogen and cryoprecipitate and one third platelets. I just go once back um, that we see what was the situation. So overall clot firm is here in XM. This is MCF. This is usually 20 millimeters higher than A5. So uh, if MCF in XM is 56, uh, the XM A5 would be about 36. So that's definitely high enough. No need for platelets. Also no need for fibrinogen. So the main issue here is a prolonged clotting time. So isolated prolonged clotting time, there are uh, finally uh, two options. One is to give four factor PCC, or if this is not available, uh, you will need to give uh, plasma. But again, with plasma, we have to be careful with the, um, with the volume. And recommend factor 7A has the issue that if there is uh, low levels of prothrombine or factor 10 or factor seven, uh, this will not work very well. And what we see here is a result after 12.5 units per kilogram body weight. So that's about 1000 units uh, in an 80 kilogram patient. You see that clotting time decreased from about 90 seconds to 60 seconds. So the, the corresponding part of the algorithm was this part because clot firmness was fine, no sign of hyperformolysis. So we have this isolated prolongation of the clotting time in XTEM with a normal FIPTEM. So the clotting time is not prolonged due to a low fibrinogen. And that brings us to the third case. Now we are dealing with patients undergoing liver transplantation. And in this case, we, we did a baseline. And this is again, the thermogram at baseline. And at baseline, we are looking if there is, for example, a need uh, even to give um, a tranexamic acid in the beginning, which we only do if the the clot firmness is very weak, or we have some signs of hyperfibrolysis. Um, and here we can look at the extem maximum lysis. 
which is about 12%. That corresponds to a lysis index 60 minutes after clotting time of 88%. Or when we look at FIPTEM, the maximum lysis is already 27%, which corresponds to a lysis index 60 minutes after CT of 73%. So the question is, what do you see on this thermogram? Is that a heparin-like effect? Is that based on low platelets? Is that a late hyperfamolysis? Is that a fambolysis shutdown? Or is that a platelet-mediated clot retraction? So let's see what is your explanation for this thermogram. Yeah, seems to be that more and more colleagues uh, selected late hyperfamilizer and then exactly the situation here in this case. And what we also see is that FIPTEM is the most sensitive test for fibrolysis because that was already 27%, where in XTEM it was borderline with 12%, uh, where a fibrolysis shutdown would mean that within one hour there would be less than 3.5% lysis um, so that is definitely the situation that we have here a late hyperfamilize already at beginning of liver transplantation. And that might be a good indication for a prophylaxis with tranexamic acid. And that's just the explanation here to this case. So we see in XTEM as well as in FIPTEM, there's some increased lysis. Uh, clot firmness in XTEM and FIPTEM is borderline, are also quite low results, not already enough for tranexamic acid just based on the clot firmness. But in combination with these late lyses, I think this might be a good indication um, to um, uh, give uh, tranexamic acid. There is no heparin like effect because the interim and haptem is both 279 seconds. So the ratio is zero. So there is definitely no heparin effect. And that brings us to case number four. And now we are moving to the resection phase. And here is just, again, a recorded thermogram. So we just wait a little bit that the thermogram is developing. Now we see the first signal in the extent in the upper right um, measurement here. Well, we are still waiting for signals. Uh, and now the FIPTEM started, but you see it's, it's quite low levels. Actually, it just uh, it's an A5 of four millimeters. And what we also see is a quite long clotting times in intem and heptem, but not a big difference. So even in intem, we have a clotting time of 495 seconds and in heptem 478. So that's less than 10% difference. But what we see now when the curve develops more and more is that we see in FIPTEM as well as in the other tests, that the, the, the clot firmness is, is decreasing after about 15 minutes and more or less completely um, destroyed within about 30 minutes. So the question is again, what does the Rotem tell us? A is no coagulopathy, B would be wait and see. Uh, option C would be give recommend factor 7A. Option D, an endogenous heparin-like effect, or E, a hyperfamolysis and low fibrinogen. And we just go to the poll questions again. So most of you selected hyperfamolysis and low fibrinogen. I think the hyperfamolysis was quite easy to see and also that the FIPTEM A5 was only four millimeters. 
Uh, what we saw in intem and heptem were that the clotting times were prolonged, but there was no significant difference between intem and heptem clotting time. And that means this is not based on an endogenous heparin-like effect, or it's rather on a factor deficiency, or that's the most uh, probable reason, it's due to the very low fibrinogen. And we know that always when fibrinogen is low, clotting times can be prolonged. And you see this here, for example, um, that, that usually when we talk also prolonged uh, extrinsic clotting times, we always double check that the fibrinogen is normal because if the fibrinogen is uh, very low, again, extrinsic as well as intrinsic clotting times can be prolonged. This is a case from Sri Lanka. <clears throat> so also severe bleeding during the liver resection or dissection phase. And what we see is that clot firmus, like in the case before, uh, is quite low. Even in XTEM, the A5 is only eight millimeters and in FIPTEM only four millimeters. Um, and when we look at INTEM, uh, there was only a runtime of about nine minutes, so we don't see a signal within nine minutes. So that, of course, makes the interpretation of the intem uh, difficult uh, because we don't know how long it takes that we would get the first signal. But what we see already is that, again, clot firmness in XTEM as well as in FIPTEM is extremely low. So... That brings us to the next question in this situation. What is the most appropriate intervention? Just giving tranexamic acid, giving fibrinogen or cryo, depends what is available in your institution, giving platelet transfusion, giving PCC, proton complex concentrate, or recumbent factor 7A, or performing a triple therapy, which is tranexamic acid, fibrinogen or cryo, as well as platelets. So about yeah, one quarter now, it's still moving. Now it's 50-50. Uh, so more or less, uh, there's an agreement uh, due to the very low clot firmness in XTEM and FIPTEM that we definitely need fibrinogen. But when we were looking, I just uh, go one forward because then we see the temogram again. Of course, there's no doubt that fibrinogen is very low, but even the platelets are also very low. So you see that even the XTEM is only eight millimeters. And that would bring us to the footnotes where if clot firmness, so XTEM clot firmness A5 is even below 10 millimeters, usually just giving fibrinogen only might not be enough. And when we have this very weak clots, uh, usually there is a recommendation also to give tranexamic acid, not because we see hypothermolysis, but uh, there is nearly no clot anymore available. So again, that brings us to the footnotes of the algorithm. We can do when we see here uh, at the first time severe bleeding, three interventions, up to three interventions at the same time, we see that the A5 in XTEM is much lower than 25 millimeters. And of course, also the A5 in FIPTEM is only half of the cutoff of eight millimeters. So overall, it's below 10. And that means, yes, there is no doubt that we need fibrinogen, but if we have really have severe bleeding and these low clot firmness results, usually we need a combination of tranexamic acid, uh, plated concentrate, and a quite huge dose of fibrinogen or cryo. Um, this is just from the experience that if we only start with one intervention, maybe it's too late and even clot firmness is further decreasing. Of course, the runtime here is too short to do a clear interpretation of the in-time clotting time. 
but this was a print out during run. So the measurement was not stopped already. And uh, that means, yes, I completely agree that there are already the A5 values is something important to, to know and then do already the first interventions, of course, in combination with the surgical interventions uh, to stop bleeding. This is case number six, uh, that is uh, five minutes after reperfusion. It's just a screenshot, uh, not a video recording, but we see here a quite similar situation as in the measurement before. We even see here that there is not a clear signal in FIPTAM. Um, there is a very severe hyperformolysis here, therefore it's called in the US the deadly diamond. Maybe here in Intem is, a uh, yeah, uh, it really looks like a diamond. And it also shows why sometimes the uptem, that's a test with a protein or tranexamic acid can be helpful because it shows that already giving an antifibrolytic drug has some positive effects. So when we compare extem and uptem, there's a significant improvement. However, uh, we see that then the clot firmus would still only be 17 millimeters. So we definitely need, in addition to giving tranexamic acid, uh, something else. And uh, that brings us to the next poll question. Should we only give tranexamic acid? Should we only give fibrinogen or cryo? Should we give a combination of tranexamic acid and fibrinogen or cryo? Should we give plasma and platelets or should we give Rickman factor 7a? So we will see what the voting would show. Yeah, there seems to be a, a clear agreement. You're, yeah. <laughs> um, we, we saw definitely a very severe hyperformolysis and we saw a complete flat line in FIPTAM. So therefore the combination of tranexamic acid and fibrinogen or cryoprecipitate seems to be reasonable. Uh, compared to the test before, I think the, the platelets were still quite okay because the clot firmness in uptem was much higher than in the case before uh, in extem. So that means we don't need the triple intervention tranexamic acid and fibrinogen or cryo and platelets. So we can wait with the platelets and just start with tranexamic acid and fibrinogen or cryo replacement. And this is just the interpretation here of this case. Uh, yeah, I think it was 100% uh, clear that there is a very severe hyperformolysis. And that's also a reason why we use this clotting time in FIPTEM more than 600 seconds. That just means 10 minutes, no signal. And that was the truth in this case where FIPTEM was just a flat line. Then overall clot firmness was significantly reduced in particular in the FIPTEM. So fibrinogen substitution by using fibrinogen concentrate or cryo would be uh, an adequate intervention here. And we see in the uptem uh, when we look at the difference between A5 in uptem and FIPTEM, that there is still uh, 17 millimeters. So this is quite okay. So maybe we don't need platelets if we can stop bleeding quickly. Um, yeah. And that is the same patient after two grams of tranexamic acid and six grams of fibrinogen concentrate. That would correspond to about 30 single units of cryo. Or if we talk about packs of five, it would be six packs of five. And we see that now the FIPTAM A5 increased to 10 millimeters. That is exactly where we want to, to, to have this patient. And we see now also that without giving any platelets, the A5 in XTEM increased to 28. So that's also higher than our, uh, our trigger for platelet transfusion. And this is also confirmed in the uptem. Now when there is no formalizes anymore, XTEM and uptem should be very similar. And we see 
28 millimeters in XTEM A5 and 27 millimeters in Aptem A5. And you also see <clears throat> that there is no need for more thrombin generation because also the clotting time is quite reproducible in FIPTEM now 63 seconds, in XTEM 65 seconds, and in Aptem even 58 seconds. So no need for more thrombin generation or even plasma transfusion or Rickman factor 7a. And that brings us to another case also at liver graft reperfusion. It's just some oozing, not severe bleeding. And we are looking again at the video recording of the thermogram. And now we get the A5 values. So we see here in FIPTEM A5 is nine millimeters. In XTEM A5, it's even 38. That's much higher than 25. So again, plated contribution is quite fine. But fibrinogen is also not too bad. But we have also here the intem and heptem. So when we look at the clotting time in FIPTEM and XTEM, this is still good. But we have a significantly prolonged intem clotting time with 502 seconds. But this is not the same in heptem. Here it's down to 195 seconds. And that brings us to the question, what is the issue? Is that a hyperfibrolysis? Is that B, low plated contribution to clot firmness? Is it C, a deficiency of vitamin K dependent coagulation factors produced in the liver? Or is D, a heparin-like effect? Or it's E, it's just no coagulopathy. Let's see. What is your decision in voting? Yeah, I think that's uh, quite clear. So that should just remind us, I know that also in Sri Lanka, you're not always running an, an heptam. This is also not needed, but if there is a significantly prolonged intem clotting time, the heptam can help us to discriminate if this is a factor deficiency and maybe plasma is needed, or it's just a heparin-like effect. And in this case, it's quite clear because the intem clotting time was longer than 500 seconds, where the heptem clotting time was below 200 seconds. So that means the ratio between intem and heptem clotting time is at least 2.5. So this is a significant heparin effect, which we very often see after reperfusion of the liver graft. But most of the time, it's just self-limiting. And if a liver graft is working quite well, it just disappears. And this is here the interpretation. Again, no need to increase clot firmness because FIPTEM as well as XTEM was definitely fine. Uh, there's also no um, issue with uh, thrombin generation based on the factors produced in the liver, but there was a clear prolongation of the intem clotting time, even more than 500. So the ratio, if we divide intem clotting time by heptem clotting time, was 2.6. That even allows us to calculate uh, more or less the anti-10A activity, which is about 0.5. Um, so if the patient would really have a severe bleeding at that time, we could reverse the effect with a very small dose of protamine. But as I mentioned, in most patients, this is just self-limiting. And uh, we can just double check uh, if the intem clotting time normalizes within the next 20 to 30 minutes. And then maybe we don't even have to give a protamine to such a patient. Yeah, and uh, this is 20 minutes in the same patient without intervention. And we just uh, double checked here the, the Rotem analysis. And you see there's not a big change in the A5 or FIPTEM and XTEM. That's more or less the same. But we see now the intem CT went down from more than 500 to 244. And uh, it's a very similar to the heptem clotting time. So that means if we see this normalization and also from the clinical point of view, 
uh, uh, less bleeding, um, then there is no need for giving protamine or uh, other factors. And that's just the calculation here. Now we have a ratio of 0.97, so very close to one and no need for an intervention. And that's the last case. Um, here the patient was already at the ICU and then at the ICU, the patient started to bleed again. And the question is, oh yeah, that's, that's a copy from another case. It's even not a liver transplant. That was even a postpartum hemorrhage, but the same could happen also in the liver transplantation. Uh, and what would be the next step if we see these results? Should we give tranexamic acid, plasma transfusion, plated transfusion, run an heptam, or giving repagomin factor 7a? So half of you are for tranexamic acid, and the others say uh, check heptam. I just go once back. So we don't see at that time any fabolysis. So it's still increasing here, even after about 50 minutes. But there's a complete flat line in intent. Of course, also the fiptem is quite low. So the situation in this case was that maybe this was a primary reason that patients start to bleed. And what we do quite often in, in patients, and this was a severe postpartum hemorrhage before, um, that we put big lines. So this patient got a shelving catheter, which is usually used for dialysis, but can also be used to give a huge volumes. And it was blocked with heparin. And when the patient started to bleed at the ICU, uh, unfortunately, nobody removed the heparin and just started a transfusion via the catheter, which resulted in a big bolus of heparin. And uh, of course, then the patient even had more bleeding because now it's a low fibrinogen and uh, uh, a bolus injection of a pure heparin. So in this case, we can just confirm it by running an heptam. And then, of course, it's very reasonable to uh, reverse the heparin effect by protamine. Okay, yeah, that's just the interpretation here. Um, yeah, what is the effect of uh, uh, all this knowledge also on guidelines and how it's recommended to, to guide bleeding uh, also in patients with chronic liver disease? There's a general recommendation uh, from the European Society of Anesthesiology in severe bleeding, not specific for the liver transplant patient to use standardized viscoelastic testing guided hemostatic algorithms with predefined intervention triggers. So actually a 1B recommendation, maybe it will change to 1A recommendation because there's even more evidence available now. But the point is not just to run viscoelastic testing, we should have algorithms uh, with predefined intervention triggers adapted to the patient population. It's very similar what the British Society of Hematology recommends. They clearly recommend not to use PTINR in patients with chronic liver disease because they are good to define the severity of the disease, but they are not reliable to predict bleeding in patients with chronic liver disease. Second uh, point is, since we know that patient with chronic liver disease, uh, with cirrhosis, in particular, if they have additional infection, very often have an heparin-like effect. So that means we should also use tests which eliminates the heparin effect or proves the heparin effect. And the FIPTEM is very important to guide fibrinogen replacement. Um, it's also in between, uh, uh, in line with the recommendation from the American Society of Gastroenterology, that they also clearly recommend to use viscoelastic testing 